It's time for chapter 11. I'm so excited. Welcome to Miss Tucker Reads. Hopefully you are a subscriber on my channel. If not, hopefully this video makes you want to be. Oh, that looks like the America Wants You poster. Sorry. Okay. Um, it's Chapter 11 is called Harvest. And remember, chapter 11 is the chapter before the chapter before the last chapter. So we're almost done. So chapter 11, Harvest. Uh, from Little House in the Big Woods by Laura Ingalls Wilder. Pa and Uncle Henry traded work. When the grain got ripe in the fields, Uncle Henry came to work with Pa, and Aunt Polly and all the cousins came to spend the day. Then Pa went to help Uncle Henry cut his grain, and Ma took Laura and Mary and Carrie to spend the day with Aunt Polly. Ma and Aunt Polly worked in the house, and all the cousins played together in the yard till dinner time. Aunt Polly's yard was a fine place to play because the stumps were so thick. The cousins played jumping from stump to stump without ever touching the ground. Even Laura, who was the littlest, could do this easily in the places where the smallest trees had grown close together. Cousin Charlie was a big boy, going on 11 years old, and he could jump from stump to stump all over the yard. The smaller stumps he could jump two at a time, and he could walk on the top rail of the fence without being afraid. Pa and Uncle Henry were out in the field, cutting the oats with cradles. A cradle was a sharp steel blade fastened to a framework of, a wooden, of wooden slats that caught and held the stalks of grain when the blade cut them. Pa and Uncle he uh, Henry excuse me, carried the cradles by their long curved handles and swung the blades into the standing oats. When they had cut enough to make a pile, they slid the cut stalks off the slats into neat heaps on the ground. It was hard work, walking around and around the field in the hot sun, and with both hands swinging the heavy cradles into the grain and cutting it, then sliding it into the piles. After all the grain was cut, they must go over the field again. This time, they would stoop over each pile, taking up handfuls of the stalks in each hand, and they would knot them together to make a longer strand. Then, gathering up the pile of grain in their arms, they would bind it tightly around with the band they had made, and tie the band and tuck in its ends. After they had made seven such bundles, then the bundles must be shocked. To make each shock, they stood five bundles upright, snugly together with the oat heads up. Then over these, they put two more bundles, spreading out the stalks to make a roof and shelter the five bundles from dew and rain. Every stalk of the cut grain must always be safely in a shock before dark, for lying on the dewy ground all night would spoil it. Pa and Uncle Henry were working very hard because the air was so heavy and hot and still that they expected rain. The oats were ripe, and if they were not cut and in the shock before rain came, the crop would be lost. Then Uncle Henry's horses would be hungry all winter. At noon, Pa and Uncle Henry came to the house in a great hurry and swallowed their dinner as quickly as they could. Uncle Henry said that Charlie must help them that afternoon. Laura looked at Pa when Uncle Henry said that. At home, Pa had said to Ma that Uncle Henry and Aunt Polly spoiled Charlie. When Pa was 11 years old, he had done a good day's work every day in the fields driving a team, but Charlie did hardly any work at all. Now Uncle Henry said that Charlie must come to the field. He could save them a great deal of time. He could go to the spring for water, and he could fetch them the water jug when they needed a drink. He could fetch the wet stone when the blades needed sharpening. All the children looked at Charlie. Charlie did not want to go to the field. He wanted to stay in the yard and play, but, of course, he did not say so. Pa and Uncle Henry did not rest at all. They ate in a hurry and went right back to work, and Charlie went with them. Now Mary was the oldest, and she wanted to play a quiet, ladylike play. So in the afternoon, the cousins made a playhouse in the yard. The stumps were chairs and tables and stoves, and leaves were dishes, and sticks were the children. On the way home that night, Laura and Mary heard Pa tell Ma what happened in the field. Instead of helping Pa and Uncle Henry, Charlie was making all the trouble he could. He got in their way so they couldn't swing the cradles. He hid the whetstone so they had to hunt for it when the blades needed sharpening. He didn't bring the water jug till Uncle Henry shouted at him three or four times, and then he was sullen. Sullen means, like, hmm, grumpy and sort of spiteful. Um... Um, not helping cheerfully, but in a slow way and kind of going out of your way to not be helpful. That's what Charlie was doing. 
After that, he followed them around, talking and asking questions. They were working too hard to pay attention to him, so they told him to go away and not to bother them. But they dropped their cradles and ran to him across the field when they heard him scream. The woods were all around the field, and there were snakes in the oats. When they got to Charlie, there was nothing wrong, and he laughed at them. He said, I fooled you that time. Pa said if he had been Uncle Henry, he would have tanned the boy's hide for him right then and there, but Uncle Henry did not do it. So they took a drink of water and went back to work. Three times Charlie screamed, and they ran to him as fast as they could, and he laughed at them. He thought it was a good joke, and still Uncle Henry did not tan his hide. Then the fourth time he screamed louder than ever. Pa and Uncle Henry looked at him, and he was jumping up and down, screaming. They saw nothing wrong with him, and they had been fooled so many times that they went on with their work. Charlie kept on screaming, louder and shriller. Pa did not say anything, but Uncle Henry said, Let him scream. So they went on working and let him scream. He kept jumping up and down, screaming. He did not stop. At last, Uncle Henry said, Maybe something really is wrong. They laid down their cradles and went across the field to him. And all that time, Charlie had been jumping up and down on a yellow jacket's nest. The yellow jackets lived in a nest in the ground, and Charlie stepped on it by mistake. Then all the little bees in their bright yellow jackets came swarming out with their red-hot stings, and they hurt Charlie so that he couldn't get away. He was jumping up and down, and hundreds of bees were stinging him all over. They were stinging his face and his hands and his neck and his nose. They were crawling up his pants legs and stinging and crawling back to the or oh sorry, and crawling down the back of his neck and stinging. The more he jumped and screamed, the harder they stung. Pa and Uncle Henry took him by the arms and ran him away from the yellow jacket's nest. They undressed him, and his clothes were full of yellow jackets, and their stings were swelling up all over him. They killed the bees that were stinging him, and they shook the bees out of his clothes, and then they dressed him again and sent him to the house. Laura and Mary and the cousins were playing quietly in the yard when they heard a loud, blubbering cry. Charlie came bawling into the yard, and his face was so swollen that the tears could hardly squeeze out of his eyes. It's really dangerous when you get stung that many times you can die because it's it's so much poison in your body. Some people have died that way before. Scary. Um, his fingers stood out stiff and swollen. There were little hard white dents all over his puffed up face and neck. Laura and Mary and the cousins stood and looked at him. Ma and Aunt Polly came running out of the house and asked him what was the matter. Charlie blubbered and bawled. Ma said it was Yellow Jackets. She ran to the garden and got a big pan of earth while Aunt Polly took Charlie into the house and undressed him. They made a big panful of mud and plastered him all over with it. They rolled him up in an old sheet and put him to bed. His eyes were swollen shut and his nose was a funny shape. Ma and Aunt Polly covered his whole face with mud and tied the mud on with cloths. Only the end of his nose and his mouth showed. Aunt Polly steeped some herbs to give him for fever, because when you get stung that many times you get a fever. Laura and Mary and the cousin stood around for some time, looking at him. Here's the picture. He looks miserable. It was dark that night when Pa and Uncle Henry came from the field. All the oats were in the shock, and now the rain could come, and it would not do any harm. Oh, there was a picture earlier of a shock. Let me show you. Um, okay, so here's the cradle. Here's a picture of the cradle. So there's the curvy bits that hold the pieces. This is very interesting. Okay, and then here's what a shock looks like. So you lean them up against each other and then you cover the top with a bundle so that it protects the rest from the rain. That's also the way that a haystack works because since there's, there's sort of a top layer, the rain flows off instead of sitting in the, in the grass and rotting it. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, there's the picture. Okay. Pa could not stay to supper. He had to get home and do the milking. The cows were already waiting at home, and when cows were not milked on time, they did not give so much milk uh, because the body, the cow's body learns if you don't milk them, they're like, oh, we don't need to make milk anymore, and so it makes less milk the next time, and then you don't have milk for butter and, thing, and cheese and all the things we talked about. 
He hitched up quickly, and they all got into the wagon. Pa was very tired, and his hands ached so that he could not drive very well, but the horses knew the way home. Ma sat beside him with baby Carrie, and Laura and Mary sat, oh, there you go. Sorry, I should call it Miss Tucker yawns. Mary sat beside him, blah, 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 and Laura and Mary sat on the board behind them. Then they heard Pa tell about what Charlie had done. Laura and Mary were horrified. They were often naughty themselves, but they had never imagined that anyone could be as naughty as Charlie had been. He hadn't worked to help save the oats. He hadn't minded his father quickly when his father spoke to him. He had bothered Pa and Uncle Henry when they were hard at work. Then Pa told about the yellow jacket's nest, and he said, It served the little liar right. After she was in the trundle bed that night, Laura lay and listened to the rain drumming on the roof and streaming from the eaves, and she thought about what Pa had said. She thought about what the yellow jackets had done to Charlie. She thought it served Charlie right, too. It served him right because he had been so monstrously naughty, and the bees has had and the bees had had a right to sting him when they jumped on their when he jumped I can't reading it's a struggle okay it served him right because he had been so monstrously naughty and the bees had a right to sting him when he jumped on their home Got it. Okay. but she didn't understand why Pa had called him a little liar she didn't understand how Charlie could be a liar when he had not said a word this is that's the end of the chapter. This is why I love this book because she really shows you things um, from a child's perspective. It's very it's cool because Laura is so little she does she can only understand lying as saying things that aren't true. But Charlie, of course, was lying when he was screaming because nothing was happening to him. He was making it up, and we know that that's a kind of a lie. But since Laura's little, she's like four years old, she doesn't get it. Um, but that's such a great little picture of of her thoughts. I love I love the way that Laura Ingalls Wilder writes. Um, so that that was a short chapter and the next week we have chapter 12, The Wonderful Machine, which is also about harvesting. And then after that we have The Deer in the Wood and then we are done with this book. Oh my gosh. But you know, you can start thinking about acquiring these books for themselves for yourself because after that there's Little House on the Prairie Farmer Boy, uh, which is, Farmer Boy is a, a sort of a different, it's much thicker, and it's about Almanza Wilder, who grows up to be Laura Ingalls' husband. They get married, that's why it's Laura Ingalls Wilder, and it tells about Almanza Wilder's childhood in a different place, and he has loads and loads of brothers and sisters and cousins and things, and so it's a very different kind of story. It's, it's a good one. Uh, Farmer Boy, on the banks of Plum Creek, we go back to Laura by the shores of Silver Lake, the long winter, little house, or sorry, little town on the prairie, these happy golden years, and the first four years, and those are all the little house books. And then even after that, if you still can't get enough of this kind of a story, there are also more stories about Laura's daughter Rose um, and her life, so that's pretty cool. Uh, just something to think about as we're coming to the end of the book. I got to, for this past week, I got to... Um, dress up as a book character for my school. We had Read Across, Read Across America week, and um, I dressed up as Pippi Longstocking, which was super fun. Uh, and I got to read some Pippi Longstocking to my kids because they didn't know what Pippi Longstocking was. And I thought, well, goodness gracious. So I, re I read the book to them on the day, the first chapter, on the day that I was dressed up as her so they would know who I was and that I wasn't just some crazy lady with mismatched clothes all over the place. Um, but it was so much fun that I'm really considering reading Pippi Longstocking next for Miss Tucker Reads because um, they were written in the 1950s, but they were still popular when I was a kid, and they, there was a movie made at some point that, that I think they still play on cable, like, late at night, um, and so I think there was a, re a revival, sort of, of the Pippi stories, but none of the kids today know who she is, and that's a shame, because they're wonderful stories, and they're, they're so funny and crazy, and, um, really full of the joy of childhood also. So I like reading Pippi, and I think that's what we're going to do next. So um, that being said, it's a short video tonight, but I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you tune back next time for Miss Tucker Reads. Happy Monday, have a great week, and I'll see you later.